From Hollywood, California, Columbia presents Leslie Howard and Rosalind Russell in Much Ado About Nothing. With tonight's production of Much Ado About Nothing, the Columbia Network presents the second in its cycle of Shakespearean plays for the summer season of 1937. A cycle which includes eight of Shakespeare's finest plays to be heard every Monday night at this time during July and August. In these plays, each especially adapted for a full hour radio presentation, many of the world's most distinguished actors will join with Columbia in bringing the great dramatist's work to a larger audience than he has ever reached before. Tonight's presentation, Much Ado About Nothing, co-stars Leslie Howard, stage and screen favorite of two continents, and Rosalind Russell, lovely and talented star of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production. Miss Russell, whose recent successes include China Seas and Night Must Fall, plays the role of Beatrice. Mr. Howard, following his screen triumph as Romeo and his stage success as Hamlet, plays the part of Benedict. A distinguished supporting cast in the order of their appearance includes Dennis Green as Claudio, John Davidson as Don Pedro, Ben Webster as Leonato, Jack Spart as Baracchio, and Lionel Braham as Dogberry. Victor Bay, Columbia's talented young conductor, takes the stand to lead the orchestra in the musical introduction. And as the curtain rises, Conway Turrell, distinguished actor of stage and screen, comes forward as narrator to set the stage for the first scene of Much Ado About Nothing. Much to do about nothing is all about a house party, where Beatrice, an attractive and witty girl who hates men, meets Benedict, a smart young officer who scorns women. The story, too, of Claudio, boon companion to Benedict and his sweetheart hero, cousin to Beatrice. Benedict and Claudio are just home from war, but are still on duty as aides to their general, Don Pedro. As they pass through the town of Messina, Leonardo, the governor, naturally entertains them. We say naturally because he has two young ladies in his household who are of marriageable age. The party is just beginning. The young men have met the young ladies. The young ladies have sized up the men. And now Claudio draws his friend Benedict aside. Benedict, didst thou note the daughter of Signor Leonardo, the lady hero? Claudio, I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? You question me as an honest man should do, for my simple true judgment... Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I pray thee speak in sober judgment. Why, if Aeth methinks she's too low for a high praise, too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise? I do not like her. Thou thinkest I am in sport. I pray thee tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? Can the world buy such a jewel? Yeah, and a case to put it into. In mine eyes, she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. There's her cousin Beatrice, and she were not possessed with a fury. Exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May doth the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband. Have you? I would scarce trust myself, though I had sworn the contrary. If Hero would be my wife. Is yes, come to this. Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to it, Faith. And thou wilt needs thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sigh away Sundays. Look, Don Pedro is returned to seek you. Benedict! Claudio! What secret hath held you here? Don Pedro, I would your grace would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear, Count Claudio? I can be secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so. But on my allegiance, mark you this, on my allegiance, he is in love with who? Mark how short his answer is. With hero, Leonardo's short daughter. Amen, if you love her, for the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. And by my two faiths and trusts, my lord, I spoke mine. That I love her, I feel. That she is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved nor know how she should be worthy is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. Thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of beauty. And never could maintain his part but in the force of his will. 
That a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. Because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any, I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for the which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. <laughs> I shall see thee ere I die. Look pale with love. <laughs> with anger, with sickness, or with hunger, my lord. Not with love. Well, if ever thou dost fall from this faith, thou wilt prove a notable argument. Farewell. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me. <laughs> and he that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder and called Adam. Well, as time shall try. In time, the savage bull doth bear the yoke. And so, I take my leave. Mm, the savage bull may. But if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead. Let me be vilely painted, and in such great letters as they write, here is good horse to hire. Let them signify under my sign, here you may see Benedict, the married man. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. What, Nobody my... marks you. What, my le dear lady Disdain, are you yet living? Is it possible Disdain should die while she has such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself must convert to Disdain if you come in her presence. Mm, then is courtesy a turncoat. But it is certain, Lady Beatrice, I am loved of all ladies, only you accepted. And I would I could find it in my heart that I had not a hard heart. For truly, I love none. <laughs> a dear happiness to women. I thank God in my cold blood I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. Mm, God keep your ladyship still in that mind. So some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. <laughs> Scratching could not make it worse, as to such a face as you wear. Well, you are a rare parrot, teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse had the speed of your tongue, and so good a continuer. But keep your way, in God's name, I've done. You always end with the jade's trick. I know you of old. <laughs> it's now evening, and the guests have just risen from a magnificent dinner which the governor, Leonardo, has exhausted all the resources of the town to do honor to his distinguished visitors. The dancing is about to begin. The guests have hurried to their rooms to don the masks, which make flirtation easier. Leonardo rushes from chamber to hall, from hall to, to garden, to make sure that all is in order. He comes upon Beatrice sitting alone in the garden and pauses to shake his finger at her. By my troth, Beatrice... Thou'lt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. With the witch blessing, Uncle, I am upon my knees every morning and evening. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. No, not till God make men of some other metal than earth. <laughs> Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a piece of valiant dust? To make an account of her life to a clod of wayward marl? No, Uncle, I'll none. Wooing, wedding, and repenting is a Scotch jig, a measure, and a sink pace. The first suit is hot and hasty like a Scotch jig. And full is fantastical. Uh -huh. The wedding, mannerly modest, as a measure, full of state and ancientry. And then comes repentance, and with his bad legs, falls into the sink pace faster and faster till he sinks into his grave. <laughs> Cousin, you apprehend passing shrewdly. Uh, I have a good eye, Uncle. I can see a church by daylight. <laughs> Count Claudio draws his commanding officer, Don Pedro, into the garden. Don Pedro, your highness now may do me good. My love is thine to teach, Claudio. Pass Leonato any son, my lord. Uh, no child but hero. She's his only heir. Uh, dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord. If thou dost love hero, cherish it. And thou shalt have her. How sweetly you do minister to love. I will fit thee with a remedy. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise, and in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart and take her here in prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. And the conclusion is, she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. Beatrice, meanwhile, reluctantly enters the ballroom where the masked couples are gaily chatting. A young man in a crimson doublet with a mask of the same color, bows gallantly, asks her to dance. This is Benedict, though she does not recognize him. The opportunity is too good to miss. 
He tells her a few home truths. Will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. No, will you not tell me who you are? Not now. That I was disdainful. That I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Well, this was Signor Bendick that said so. What's he? I'm sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, uh, he is the Princess Jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but liberty is delight in him. And the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy. For he both pleases men and angers them. And then they laugh at him and beat him. <laughs> when I know the gentleman, I, I'll tell him what you say. Do. Benedict. Benedict. No. Benedict, the Lady Beatrice hath a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her told her she is much wronged by you. Oh, she misused me past the endurance of a block. An oak with but one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great Thor, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark with a whole army shooting at me. <laughs> she speaks poniards and every word stabs. I would not marry her, though she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. Come, talk not of her. <laughs> look, look, here she comes. Will your grace command me to any service to the world's end? I will go on the slightest errand that you can devise to send me on, rather than hold three words conference with this harpy. <laughs> you have no employment for me? None, but to desire your good company. Oh, heaven, sir, here's a dish I love not. Don Pedro, I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why, how now, Count? Uh, wherefore are you sad? Not sad, my lord. Uh, how then? Uh, sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad, nor sick, nor merry, nor well. But civil, Count. Civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. <laughs> if faith, lady, I think you're blazoned to be true. Here, Claudio, I've wooed in thy name, and fair hero is one. I've broke with her father, and his goodwill obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say amen to it. My lord, Claudio, speak, Count, it is your cue. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself for you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let not him speak neither. <laughs> <laughs> In faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Uh, yes, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. Ah, oh, good lord for alliance. Thus goes every one to the world but I, and I am sunburned. I may sit in a corner and cry, hey-ho, for a husband. <laughs> lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I would rather have one of your father's getting. Hath your grace near a brother like you? Your father got excellent husbands if a maid could come by them. Will you have me, lady? No, my lord. Unless I might have another for working days. Your <laughs> grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence most offends me. And to be merry best becomes you. For out of question, you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord. My mother cried. But then there was a star dance. And under that I was born. Cousin, God give you joy. By my troth, Leonardo, a pleasant spirited lady. <laughs> There's little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad but when she sleeps. Yeah, but she cannot endure to hear tell of her husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all her wooers out of suit. She were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, Lord, Lord. If they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Count Claudio, uh, when mean you to go to church? Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches till love have all his rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is a hence a just seven night. A time too brief, too, to have all things answered to my mind. Oh, my lord. Come, you shake the head at so long a breathing. But I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will in the interim... Undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is 
to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection, the one with the other. <laughs> if you three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you if it cost me ten nights watching. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the unhopefulest husband that I know. I will teach you how to humor your cousin Beatrice that she shall fall in love with Benedict. And I... With your two helps, we'll so practice on Benedict that, in despite of his quick wit and his squeezy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. <laughs> Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. It is now the next afternoon. Don Pedro has rehearsed his fellow conspirators in their parts, and he is now ready to open up the campaign to make Benedict fall in love with Beatrice. Don Pedro, Leonardo, and Claudio stroll casually into the sunlit garden, pretending not to know that Benedict sits reading in a nearby arbor. Benedict hopes he has escaped for a few hours from women and matchmaking, but the voices of his friends intrude upon his solitude. <laughs> Leonardo, uh, what was it you told me after day? That your niece, Beatrice, was in love with Signor Benedict? Oh, I... I did never think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I, neither. But most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, yes. whom she hath in all outward behaviors seemed ever to abhor. You amaze me. I would have thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had, my lord. Especially against Benedict. Uh, had she made her affection known to, uh, Benedict? No. I swear she never will. That's her torment. Tis true indeed, so your daughter says. Shall I, says she, that have so oft encountered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This says she now when she's beginning to write to him. Or she'll be up twenty times a night, and there will she sit in her smock till she hath written a sheet of paper. When she hath written it and was reading it over, she tore the letter into a thousand half pence, railed at herself, that she should be so immodest to write to one that knew would flout her. I measure him, says she, by my own spirit. For I should flout him if he writ to me. Yes, though I love him, I should. Then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. Hero thinks surely Beatrice will die. Well, mm. I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Then, nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Mm -hmm. Well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Uh, let it cool the while. Mm -hmm. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy so good a lady. Uh, my lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. We have the truth of this from Hero. We seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me. Why, I must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth, I can bear them witness. And virtuous. Tis so, I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. By my troth, it is no addition to her wit nor no great argument of her folly. For I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No, the world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Poison is working. Benedict is caught. 
Now it remains for the conspirators to work on Beatrice. Dinner is over, and Beatrice steals away into the garden, weary of her uncle's matchmaking. Hero and her lady-in-waiting receive their instructions from Don Pedro and follow after her. Beatrice withdraws behind a flowering hedge, but she cannot escape their voices. No, truly, Ursula. She is too disdainful. But are you sure that Benedict loved Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new trop and lord. They did entreat me to acquaint her of it. But I persuaded them, if they loved Benedict, to wish him messer with affection, never to let Beatrice know of it. For nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. She cannot love, nor take no shape, nor project of affection. She is so self dear. Sure, I think so. And therefore, certainly it were not good she knew his love, that she makes sport at it. Why, you speak true. I never yet saw man how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured, but she would fell him backwards. Sure, sure, such coughing is not common. No, not to be so ardent from all fashions as Beatrice is, cannot be commonable. But who dare tell us so? If I should speak, she would mock me in the air. Therefore. Yeah. Let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in sighs, waste inwardly. It were a better death than die with mocks, which is as bad as to die with tickling. Yet tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No. Rather, I will go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion. She's lying, I warrant you. We've caught her, madam. It is proof, so. And nothing goes by half. <laughs> some Cupid kills with arrows, some with. <laughs> Far is in mine ears. Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt farewell, and maiden pride of you. No glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict, love on. I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. So Beatrice loves Benedict, and Benedict loves Beatrice. And Claudio loves Hero, and Hero loves her Claudio. In truth, the wedding bells are all but pealing. For tomorrow, Claudio and Hero will be married, followed soon, it appears, by Beatrice and Benedict. Thus proveth William Shakespeare that love will find a way. But suddenly, enter the villain. This villain... With the person of Don John is the illegitimate brother of Don Pedro. After a life of knavery, he has been taken back into his brother's good graces and travels in the prince's train with his two henchmen, Conrad and Baracchio. But during the house party, he has held suddenly aloof. Now, with his equally villainous henchmen, he sits brooding. His henchman, Conrad, speaks. What the good year, my lord? Why are you thus out of measure, sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breathes. Therefore, the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? If not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. You have of late stood out against your brother, Don Pedro, and he has taken you newly into his grace, where it is impossible you should take true root, but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. I am trusted with a muzzle and am franchised with a clog. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. And you make no use? Your discontent? I make all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? Boracchio. My lord. What news, Boracchio? I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve for any model to build mischief on? Well, what is he for a fool that betroths himself to unquietness? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who? 
The most exquisite Claudio? Even he. Mary on Hero, the daughter and heir of Leonardo. Her very forward march taken. Come. Come, this may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him anyway, I bless myself everywhere. Hmm. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonardo. Yea, my lord. But I can cross it. Show me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to hear her. I remember. I can, at any unseasonable instant of the night, appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window. What uh, life is in that to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to Don Pedro, your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you mightily hold up to such a one as Hero. Hmm, what uh, proof shall I make of that? Proof enough to misuse the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero and kill Leonardo. Look you for any other issue? <laughs> Only to despite them, I will endeavor anything. Go, then. Find me a meat hour to draw Don Pedro and the Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hmm. Hear me call Margaret Hero. Hmm. Hear Margaret term me Baracchio. Hmm. And bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. Hmm. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent. And there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance and all the preparation overthrown. Row this to what adverse issue it can, I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will presently go learn their day of marriage. It is the day before Claudio's wedding, and the entire household is in a gay bustle. Through the great halls, ringing with happy laughter, stalks Benedict, a changed and saddened man. For the first time in his young life, he is in love. Leonardo, Don Pedro, and Claudio can scarcely restrain their laughter as he fences feebly at their ribald jokes. Gallant, I am not as I have been. So say I, methinks you're sadder. I hope he be in love. <laughs> Thank him, true, and there's no true drop of blood in him to be truly touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. <laughs> I have the toothache. Draw it. Hang it. You must hang it first and draw it afterwards. What? <laughs> Sigh for the toothache. Well, everyone can master a grief but he that has it. Yet say I, he is in love. There's no appearance of fancy in him. If he be not in love with some woman, there is no believing old signs. He brushes his hat a mornings. What should that bode? <laughs> uh, hath any man seen him at the barber's? No, but the barber's man hath been seen with him. <laughs> and the old ornament of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. Indeed, <laughs> he looks younger than he did by the loss of a beard. <laughs> Nay, he rubs himself with civet. Can you not smell him out by that? That's as much as to say the sweet youth's in love. The greatest note of it is his melancholy. And when was he wont to wash his face? Yea, or to paint himself. Uh, for the which I hear what they say of him. Nay, but his jesting spirit, which is now crept into a lute string and now governed by stops. Indeed, that tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude he is in love. Nay, oh, but yes. I know who loves him. <laughs> that would I know too. <laughs> I warrant one that knows him not. <laughs> yes, and his ill conditions. And despite of all, dies for him. She shall be buried with her face upwards. <laughs> Yet this is no charm for a toothache. Signor Leonardo, walk aside with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak to you, which these hobby horses must not hear. For my life to break with him about Beatrice. Enter. My lord and brother, God save you. Good day, brother. If your leisure serves. I would speak with you. In private? If it please you. Yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter, Don John? Means the Count Claudio shall be married tomorrow. You know he does. 
I know not that when he knows what I know. Why, what's the matter? I came hither to tell you. And circumstances shortened, for she has been too long a talking of. The lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Even she. Leonardo's hero. Your hero. Every man's hero. Disloyal? The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber window entered even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her. But it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so? I will not think it. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, uh, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight why I should not marry her tomorrow, in the congregation where I should wed, there will I shame her. And as I wooed for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no further till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly but till midnight. And let the issue show itself. Midnight, the hour of villainy. While Don John and his henchmen are perpetrating their dirty work, the force of law and order assembles. Through the quiet streets resounds the tramp of the night watch coming on duty. At their head is <laughs> old Dogberry, the constable. Paul, this is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrant men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. How if I will not stand, Master Dogberry? Why, then, uh, take no note of him, but let him go. And presently call the rest to watch together, and thank God you're rid of a knave. You shall also make no noise in the streets. Or for the watch to babble and to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. We will rather sleep than talk, Master Dogberry. We know what belongs to a watch. Why, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman. But I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care your bills be not stolen. You're to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk Get them to bed. How oh, if they will not, Master Dogberry? Why, then, uh, let them alone till they're sober. If you meet a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why, the more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly, by your office, you may. But I think they that touch pitch will be defiled. If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her still it. And if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why then, uh, depart in peace and let the child wake her with crying. For the you that will not hear her lamb when it bars. We'll never answer a calf when he bleeds. Oh, it is very true. <laughs> this is the end of the charge. Well, masters, good night. And if you any matter of wake chances, call of me. I pray you, uh, watch about Signor Leonardo's door. For the wedding being there tomorrow, there's a great coil tonight. Adieu. Be bitchet, and I beseech you. I. <laughs> Don John's plot to slander hero succeed? Or will these simple watchmen thwart his cunning villainy? What will happen to Claudio's romance? We must wait until sunrise to find out. have been listening to the first part of the Columbia Network's presentation of Much Ado About Nothing, which stars Leslie Howard and Rosalind Russell. The second part will begin in just a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
And now, we begin the second part of Much Ado About Nothing, starring Leslie Howard as Benedict and Rosalind Russell as Beatrice. Conway Turl comes forward as narrator to set the scene. The wedding day dawns bright and fair as the guests assemble in the church to witness the marriage of Claudio and Hero. Hero, leaning on her father's arm, is radiantly happy with no thought that Don John's villainy has already blasted her happiness. Beatrice is Hero's bridesmaid. Beside Claudio stand Benedict and Don Pedro. Leonardo, the proud father, speaks to the priest. Come, Prior Francis, be brief. Only to the plain form of marriage, and you shall recount their particular duties afterwards. You come hither, Count Claudio, to marry this lady? No. To be married to her, Prior. You come to marry her. Lady, you come hither to be married to the Count? I do. If either of you know any inward impediment, why you should not be conjoined, I charge you on your souls to utter it. Know you any hero? None, my lord. Know you any count? I dare make his answer. None. Oh, what men dare do, what men may do, what men daily do, not knowing what they do. Stand thee by, Prior. Father, by your leave. Will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her me. And what have I to give you back whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your pen. Uh -huh. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she blushes there. But she is none. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married. Not to knit my soul to an approved wanton. Oh, dear, my lord. If you, in your own proof, have vanquished the resistance of her youth... No, Leonardo. I never tempted her with word too large. But as a brother of his sister showed, bashful sincerity and comely love. And seemed I ever otherwise to you. Out on thee, see me. You seem to me as Diane in her orb, as chaste as is the bud ere it be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus, or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well that he does speak so wide? Don Pedro, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that have gone about to link my dear friend to a wanton. Are these things spoken? Or do I but dream? Let me but move one question to your daughter, and by that fatherly and kindly power that you have in her, Bid her answer truly. I charge thee do so, as thou art my child. Oh, God defend me. How am I beset? What kind of catechizing call you this? What man was he talked with you yesternight out at your window betwixt twelve and one? I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why then are you no maiden? Leonardo, I am sorry you must hear. Upon mine honor, myself, my brother, and his grieved count, did see her, hear her, at that hour last night... Talk with a ruffian at her chamber window, who hath indeed most like a liberal villain, confess the vile encounters they have had a thousand times in secret. Oh, hero, what a hero hadst thou been, if half thy outward graces had been placed about the thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell. Hath no man's dagger here a point for me? <sighs> Well, how now, cousin? Wherefore sink you down? How doth the lady? Dead, I think. Hero. Why, hero. Oh, fate, take not away the heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. <gasps> how now, cousin, hero? Do not live, hero. Do not open thine eyes. Or did I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Thought I thy spirits were stronger than thy shames? Myself would on the rearward of reproaches strike at thy life. Grieved I, I had but one. Oh, one too much, I thee. Oh, she's fallen into a pit of ink, but the white sea hath drops too few to wash her clean again. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied. Would the two princes lie? And Claudio lie, who loved her so, and speaking of her foulness, washed it with tears. Hence from her, let her die. <laughs> Leonardo storms from the church, which is now emptied of its festive throng. Beatrice sinks down on the altar steps, 
weeping her heart out. Benedict, troubled and shy in his newfound love, approaches her timidly. <laughs> Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin Hero is wronged. Ah, how much might the man deserve of me that would right her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way. But no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? As strange as a thing I know not. It was possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you. But believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no source that can be devised to it, I protest I love thee. Oh, why then, God, forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice. You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart there is none left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Ha! Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Tarry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone. Oh, I am here. There, there is no love in you. May I pray you let me go. Beatrice. In faith, I will go. But we'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy. Is Claudio thine enemy? Is she not approved in the height of villain? That has slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man. But bear her in hand until they come to take hands, and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, and mitigated rancor. Oh, God, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. Talk with a man out of the window. A proper thing. Nay, but Beatrice. Sweet hero. She is wrong. She is slandered. She is undone. Beatrice. Oh, that Beatrice. I were a man or that I had a friend would be a man for my sake. I cannot be a man with wishing. Therefore, I will die a woman with grieving. Tarry, good Beatrice. By this hand, I love thee. I'll use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul the Count Claudio hath wronged Hero? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand and so I leave you. By this hand... Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me, and so farewell. Meanwhile, the priest, Friar Francis, persuades Leonardo to pretend that Hero has died of shame and grief. Thus, he says, the world will turn its sympathy to Hero, and perhaps the source of this villainy will come to light. Leonardo reluctantly agrees. But he cannot reconcile himself to his disgrace. He faces the street before his palace with his brother Antonio, the father of Beatrice. Leonardo, if you go on that, she will kill yourself. I pray thee, cease thy counsel. Bring me a father that so loved his child, whose joy of heart is overwhelmed like mine, and bid him speak of patience. Uh, therein do men from children nothing different. I pray thee, peace. I will be flesh and blood. For never was philosopher yet could endure the toothache patiently. Yet bend not all the harm upon yourself. Make those that do offend you suffer too. There thou speaks reason. Nay, I will do so. Uh, my soul doth tell me hero is belied. And that shall Claudio know. So shall the prince. And all of them the dust is on her. Here comes Don Pedro and Claudio hastily. Good day, good day. Good day to both of you. Hear you, my lord. We have some haste, Leonardo. Some haste, my lord. Well, fare you well, my lord. Are you so hasty now? Well, all is one. Nay, do not quarrel with this good old man. If he could right himself with quarreling, some of us would lie low. Who wrongs him? Marry, that dost... Thou dost wrong me, thou dissembler. Thou... Oh, Claudio, to thy head, thou hast so wronged my innocent child and me that I am forced to lay my reverence by and with gray hairs and bruise of many days to challenge thee to trial of a man. I say thou hast denied my innocent child. You say not right, old man. My lord, lord, I'll prove it on his body if he dare. Away, I will not have to do with you. Canst thou so daft me? Thou hast killed my child. Let him answer me. Come, follow me, boy. Come, sir, boy, come. 
Follow me. Sir, boy, I'll whip you from your foining fence. Nay, as a gentleman, I will. Brother. Hey, content yourself. God knows I loved my niece. And she is dead, slandered to death by villains that dare as well answer a man indeed as I dare take a serpent by the tongue. Boys, it's brackets, jacks, milk sop, brother and the whole content. What men I know them, yea, and what they weigh, even to the utmost scruple. Scambling, outfishing, uh, fashion monging boys that lie and cog and flout, deprave and slander, uh, go antically, show outward hideousness, and speak off half a dozen dangerous words. Now they might hurt their enemies if they durst, and this is all. Not Brother Anthony. Uh, it is no matter. Do not you meddle. Uh, let me deal Anthony, in this. Gentlemen, both. We will not wait your patience. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death, but on my honor. She was charged with nothing but what was true and very full of proof. My lord, my lord. I will not hear you. No, I will be heard. Then shall, or some of us will smart for it. Come, brother. Well, yeah. <laughs> Good day, my lord. Ah, now, Signor Benedict, what news? Welcome, Signor. You are almost come to part, almost afraid. <laughs> we had liked to have had our two noses snapped off with two old men without teeth. In a false quarrel, there is no true valor. We have been up and down to seek thee, for we are high-proof melancholy and would fain have it beaten away. I came to seek you both. As I'm an honest man, he looks pale. Uh, art thou sick or angry? What courage, man. What though care killed a cat, thou hast metal enough in thee to kill care. Sir, I shall meet your wit in a career and you charge it against me. I pray you choose another subject. Uh, by the slight, he changes more and more. Uh, I think he'd be angry indeed. Shall I speak a word in your ears? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. <laughs> I guess not. I will make it good how you dare, with what you dare and when you dare. Do me right or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. Well, I will meet you so I may have good cheer. <laughs> but, but when shall we set the savage bull's horns on the sensible <laughs> Benedict's head? Yea, in text underneath. Here dwells Benedict the married man. There you will, boy. You know my mind. I will leave you now to your gossip-like humor. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. You have among you killed a sweet and innocent lady. For my lord Lackbeard there... He and I shall meet. Till then, peace be with him. He is in earnest. In most profound earnest. Comedy has turned to tragedy. And love has fostered hate. But have no fear. This is the bar of Avon in a kindly mood. Uh, this is much ado about nothing. Sure enough, the night watch comes to the rescue in the nick of time. They've overheard Don John's henchmen talking of their villainy and have hailed him into court before old Dogberry, the constable. He addresses the court. <coughs> Is our old assembly appeared? Oh, a stool and a cushion for the sexton. Which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let them come before Master Constable. Yes, Mary, let them come before me. What's your name, friend? Baracchio. Pray write down Baracchio. Your sirrah. I am a gentleman, sir. My name is Conrad. Write down Master Gentleman Conrad. Masters, do you serve God? Yea, yes, sir, we hope. we hope. Write down the hope they serve God. <laughs> And write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Let the watch come forth. Masters, I charge you in the prince's name, accuse these men. This man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Uh, why, why, this is flat poetry to call a prince's brother a villain. Master Constable. To pray thee, fellow, peace. I do not like thy look, I promise thee. What heard you him say else, watchman? Marry, that he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady hero wrongfully. Flat burglary as ever was committed. Yes, by mass, that it is. What else, watchman? And that Count Claudio did mean, upon his words, to disgrace hero before the whole assembly and not marry her. Oh, villain. 
Thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this. What else, watchman? This is all. And this is more, masters, than you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Hero was in this manner accused, in this very manner refused, and upon the grief of this suddenly died. Master Constable, let these men be bound and brought to Leonardo's. I will go before and show him their examination. Come, let them be opinioned. Let them be in the hand. Answer. Oh, Coxstone. Answer. Answer. Answer, Sexton. Let him write down the prince's officer, Coxcomb. Come, bind them. Bind them. Thou naughty varlet. Away. <laughs> you are an ass. You are an ass. Oh, oh. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Masters, remember that I am an ass. Aye. Though it not be written down, yet forget not that I am an ass. Aye. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety. I shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more an officer, and which is more a householder, and which is more as pretty a piece of flesh as any is in Messina. And one that knows the law go to, and a rich fellow enough go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns and everything handsome about him. Bring him away. Oh, that I had been writ down an ass. Meanwhile, Leonardo is still pretending that Hero is dead. But old Dogbury drags Baracchio and Conrad into the presence of Don Pedro and Claudio to tell their story. How now? Two of my brother's men bound? Baracchio one? Hearken after their offense, my lord. Officers, what offense have these men done? Mary, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Secondarily, they are slanders. Six and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things. And to conclude, they are lying knaves. Uh, who have you offended, masters? This learned constable is too cunning to be understood. Uh, what's your offense, Baracchio? Sweet prince, let me go no farther to mine answer. Do you hear me and let this count kill me? I have deceived even your very eyes. What your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light. Who in the night overheard me confessing to this man how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the lady hero. How you were brought into the orchard and saw me caught Margaret in hero's garments. My villainy they have upon record which I had rather seal with my death and repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation. And briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Claudio, runs not this speech like iron through your blood? I have drunk poison whilst he uttered it. Sweet hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved it first. But did my brother set thee on to this? Yea, and paid me richly for the practice of it. He is composed and framed of treachery. Come, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time, our sexton hath reformed Signor Leonato of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. Here comes Master Signor Leonato and the sexton too. Oh, the slave that with thy breath has killed mine innocent child. Yea, even I alone. No, not so, villain. Thou beliest thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. A third is fled that had a hand in it. I thank you, princes, for my daughter's death. Record it in your high and worthy deeds. It was bravely done, if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience, yet I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin. Yet sinned I not, but in mistaking. I'm a soul, nor I. And yet to satisfy this good old man, I would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoy me to. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. 
That were impossible. But I pray you both, possess the people in Messina here, how innocent she died. So villainy receives its true reward, and love conquers all. For you may be sure that when Claudio learns that Hero has been alive all this time, the two lovers are once more united. Let us leave them to their recaptured happiness and go with Benedict into the fragrant garden to find Beatrice. For after all, this is their story. Beatrice. 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 Sweet Beatrice, wouldst thou come when I call thee? Yea, Signor, and depart when you bid me. Oh, stay but till then. Oh, then is spoken. Very well now. I pray thee now, tell me for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me? For them all together, which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? Suffer love? A good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart, I think. Alas, poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours. For I will never love that which my friend hates. Beatrice. I answer to that name. What is your will? Do not you love me? Why, no. No more than reason. Why, then your uncle and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do not you love me? Croth, no. No more than reason. Why, then my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived. For they did swear you did. They swore that you were almost sick for me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. There's no such matter. Then you do not love me? No, truly. But in friendly recompense. Come, I will have thee. But by this light, I take thee for pity. I would not deny you. But by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion. And partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace. I will stop your mouth. In Much Ado About Nothing, the second production in Columbia's Shakespearean cycle for 1937. In tonight's cast were also Dennis Green, who played Claudio, Don Davidson, who played Don Pedro, Ben Webster, who played Leonardo, Jack Smart, who played Baracchio through courtesy of Universal Pictures, Lionel Graham, who played Dogberry, and Conway Turrell, who acted as narrator. Last week, you heard Hamlet, one of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies. This week, Much Ado About Nothing, one of his gayest comedies. Next week, Columbia presents one of Shakespeare's great historical dramas, Julius Caesar, with a brilliant all-star cast, Claude Rains as Cassius, Raymond Massey as Anthony, Walter Abel as Casca, Reginald Denny as Caesar. Don't forget, next Monday, same time, same stations, Julius Caesar with an outstanding all-star cast. In tonight's performance of Much Ado About Nothing, the orchestra was under the direction of Victor Bay. The play was adapted for radio and produced by Brewster Morgan. This is a presentation of the Columbia Broadcasting System.